Hello and welcome. This is the Excite Masterclass Garage Talk, where we take an up close and personal look at the anatomy of the automobile. Today, I am on my way to Platinum Auto Spa, where I am meeting with my good friend and aspiring car enthusiast, Asanka Sahabandhu. He told me he has a few questions on how car technology developed on the circuit has made its way to your everyday road car. This should be a fun chat. How do I get into this? There any easy way, Machanka? <laughs> There's no easy way. So that's what's missing in my car. That's what's missing in your car. <laughs> Race on a Sunday, sell on a Monday. As I understand, racing has you know grown leaps and bounds, and uh, some of the technology that we see on race cars have now come into road cars. Well, actually, since the beginning of racing in automobiles, uh, there's always been a concept with car manufacturers and racing people, who, people who are involved in racing. Race on a Sunday, sell on a Monday. You know, <laughs> right. so basically, what their plan was: uh, test the components out in the car, uh, make sure it's reliable. For consumer, uh, for the consumer on the road, and generally bring their brand out, win at the race, and then people know about your name. So uh, that was the initial concept, and now it has transitioned into a greater concept where uh, the technology itself is being used on the race vehicle to to be manufactured for uh, the road purposes. Okay. So Asanka, we've got a bench mm -hmm. with some goodies set up. Okay. Uh, I think it might be easier to kind of explain and find out about all this when we will move over to the bench and have a look at what we've got there. All right, let's go. So, uh, let's talk about the pistons first. This looks like a forged piston uh, compared to the cast piston. I think it's got my name on it as well, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, basically. Can uh, we compare, yeah. Yeah, we've got, got a whole load of parts. We'll start with the piston. Uh, I think uh, we've got to thank uh, Nigel of 52 Racing for getting us all this stuff. Uh, so basically, what we have here is the cast piston and this is a forged piston. The reason people use forged pistons and when you say forged pistons, you have to understand the, the concept of it. It comes from back in the day, you know, when samurai and warriors and vikings used to forge their weapons. It's kind of the same technology they used to forge the piston. So they take a block of aluminium and uh, they heat it and then they press form it into the mold of a piston. Whereas a cast piston is, is a mold and then the iron is pulled in and it just fills the cast. So what means that this is a lot stronger, can withstand a lot more temperature, a lot yeah. more abuse in a road car as opposed to a cast piston. But also, it kind of means that uh, you don't have much money left over when you buy a set of forged pistons. <laughs> explains, yeah, that explains yeah. my pedicure. So, uh, on the outside, you don't see much of a difference. One of the main differences is that you can't see it now because both the pistons are used, but the forged piston is generally nice and shiny, shiny. and clear, whereas the cast piston has like the grains of iron right. in it. Right. Uh, but generally, the, the process of forging makes a piston much stronger and ability to withstand and more reliability. I think that's the main thing because Road cars okay. are driven in traffic. Point A to point B. Point A to point B. You're never at the optimum limit. But on a race car, you're on the racetrack. You're always on the red line. So you've got to have something a little more stronger than uh, the regular cast piston. So let's move to the turbos as well. Uh, All right. Does size matter? They say that size <laughs> matters. Bigger the turbo, bigger the power. With the turbo, size does matter. <laughs> Yeah, so basically this is this is a pretty large turbo. This is of a Mitsubishi Evolution 9. Uh, so uh, it's a car that can produce about 300 to 400 horsepower even in stock stock trim. I mean the, the factory detunes the car to produce about 280 horsepower but this turbo is capable of uh, 400 horsepower right. with, the, with the correct mapping. Right. I mean uh, basically it's a very simple process. I mean there's just the, the hot side which is this where the exhaust comes in. The cold side which is this where the it compresses the air and flows into the turbocharger and with a standard turbocharger there are lots of upgrades that you can do you can change the size of the wheels you can uh, uh, change the type of bearing that you're right. using in the turbo you can go from a journal to a ball bearing you know so all those kind of elements will help increase uh, a turbocharger's reliability help increase a turbocharger's performance and uh, in in the beginning turbocharging was quite a new concept but now really Virtually every car on the road. I think most of the, even the compact cars with, uh, you know, come up with a 1.3 litre turbo charge. We, we hear this often. Back in the day, people used to say, yeah, don't get a turbo charged car. Why would you need a turbo charged car? But most cars now, 
come equipped to the turbo. Yeah, that, that's fantastic because actually turbocharging in the beginning was like a car that would consume a lot of fuel yes, and correct. produce a lot of power but have very poor fuel, fuel yeah, economy. Yeah. But now even if you see like 600cc, 800cc, 1000cc cars are coming with turbochargers just so they can make the engine capacity smaller yeah. and the fuel efficiency higher. Yeah. So this is a direct result of actually taking the turbocharger and bolting it onto race cars and going racing yeah. has helped the technology develop so much that it is now a roadworthy technology for for saving fuel. All right, but I like the making power power part of it. Power part of it, yeah, <laughs> for sure. Uh, let's have a look at the suspension. Here we have a stock suspension uh, and then um, an adjustable racing suspension. Uh, most cars, most road cars, don't come with adjustable suspension. Um, what can you tell us about this? So uh, let let me just lift this up. I think the the first thing that you have to kind of see is the the shaft on this uh, standard suspension is very thin at the top. Yes. Uh, so basically what that means is that the shaft works down and it compresses the oil or mm. gas in the bottom part of the, of the suspension uh, on a road car. But in a race car we have what we call the inverted monotube because right. the, the shaft works upside down. Right. So basically when it goes down, oil or gas works both ways. So it's a dual flow system right, right, right. and what, what that helps does is it evens the compression and the rebound of the shaft. So basically, you know, when you're on a racing drive on the track and you're driving, the main thing that you want to know is that when a car hits a bump, when a car hits a rut, when a car hits a curb, that it's going to act the same way every single time. So having a, a suspension with this system gives that evenness. Obviously, uh, the reason why they don't have it in a regular car that comes all the time is the cost and also the ability to change suspension if you, if you, if you have a problem. Uh, and also, as you can see, there are like these all these grooves, the grooves to yeah. adjust so, the height, so that right? you can adjust the height of the suspension and you can yeah. adjust the, uh, the tension on the spring. So there are a lot of, lot of uh, differences. But adjusting uh, the ride height of a road uh, car might not be advisable. Uh, uh, no, I mean speeds. You know, that's, is that, your... that, is, that is something that, uh, that people think is a negative, but it's not because generally upgrading a suspension from a factory stock setup to to either raise or lower the car is an optional choice. I mean, generally in a country like Sri Lanka where there are a lot of potholes, a lot of bumps, I wouldn't mind upgrading to a set of rally suspension uh, which would give me the same comfort as okay. a road car but I can raise my car and I can just take it even anywhere. Even if yeah. I want to go to Yala yeah. or on a safari, I can take my road car, yeah. you know, whereas you'd, otherwise you'd need a SUV. So, so I've kind of done that as well on, on my road car, you know, got uh, a little higher rally suspension which gives me the same comfort but uh, also gives me the advantages of raising it as well. So it's an upgrade that I highly recommend anybody even on their road car. Yeah. Uh, talking about comfort versus uh, performance. Uh, uh, when you have comfort, you don't have performance. When you have performance, when you, you don't, you kind of sacrifice on the comfort, yeah, right? So, so the main problem with that is when you've got cheaper suspension. <laughs> <laughs> so the more the more you spend, uh, you can get the comfort and the performance as well. Right. So and you can uh, you, you see on this suspension there's this uh, adjustment point Correct. here. So yes. with that you can control just how hard or how stiff, stiff you want the suspension. Want. So I mean generally we see uh, suspension modifications are worth like two three seconds a lap at a track when you when you get it right. But it is like it's like a black magic. You know you've got to be at it and you've got to do it all over and over again. I think that's one of the reasons why uh, factories don't want to bring it out straight out of the factory because generally a lot of people don't know how to adjust the suspension properly. Uh, it takes a little bit of time and a lot of work to get right. Alright, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So Asanka, having uh, discussed the suspension, uh, I've got some nice suspension on my Evo okay. uh, and I think you're going to see it and you're going to be uh, pretty amazed by it. So I think uh, we should go have a look at that. Alright, let's go pop the hood. So Asanka, this is it, uh, the Mitsubishi Evolution 7, my race car. Um, shall we start at the yeah, we, we should the heart of it all, the engine bay. <laughs> Let's just could you uh, yeah. just lift it up? I know you you owned uh, something similar to an Evo at uh, Evo earlier version, was it? Some time <laughs> ago, so you might recognize the Mitsubishi yeah. engine. So we had a look at the suspension on the bench. Yes. And now uh, I want to show you what's underneath uh, the hood of this car because this is something really nice. If you look at it here, you can see it's got, got this uh, 
uh, aircraft grade line that's coming up into a canister right here. Yes, yes. So that is what you call canister suspension. Right. So basically, you will never see this at the moment on a road car technology. This is very new, uh, developed in the last 10 years, and uh, it is very, very high performance, also very expensive. Uh, the reason for that is why they have an external canister. This is filled with nitrogen, right. and you can run the car for elongated periods of time over jumps, over bumps. The suspension can take uh, a massive amount of compression and rebound and never overheat. Right. And it has the durability of uh, about 10 times more than a road-going vehicle. Now. This technology, I'm not saying that it is not coming into road cars. You can, you can, if you have a road evolution, you can buy this suspension and you can fit it to your, fit it to your, uh, fit it to your road car. Yeah. Obviously, not from the manufacturer. Yeah. Possibly because of the cost factor, yeah. uh, they won't build it out of the factory. But generally, the tuning companies, aftermarket tuning companies, uh, people who build uh, parts for Evolutions and Mitsubishi's or any other brand, they will sell you this kit as an upgrade, a suspension upgrade that you can fit right, in. Right. But uh, this is uh, a high-grade uh, racing component uh, and it is also used for the road by, by enthusiasts who want to upgrade their suspension. So that's as far as we can go with the state-of-the-art suspension. This radiator looks like it's upgraded, uh, the cooling system in itself. Shall we have a look? Yeah, so obviously, you know, uh, that's one of the biggest upgrades that you've got to do, one of the first upgrades. Yeah. Uh, we've got Normal, regular road cars come with a single core or a twin core uh, radiator at most. Here we've got a three core thick aluminium radiator. It's not plastic that you'll find in the road cars. Uh, it's a massively upgraded component. It's built not only for cooling, but it's also built for reliability because in contact racing, you might have an issue where you might collide with another vehicle or with a, uh, outside uh, uh, some greenery or some yeah. foliage. Uh, so the, the radiator has got to have some strength in it to be able to withstand a certain amount of force. So it's got cooling plus it's got strength in it. Uh, this is also a racing component, which is a transferable upgrade to road going cars. And I mean, generally, car manufacturers won't recommend, I mean, not that they don't recommend it, they don't develop it out of the factory, yeah. but any garage, any tuning company will tell you, if your radiator has done about 10 years worth of regular service, it's time to upgrade to an uh, aluminum one with a bigger core. You think in 2021, most cars would have an upgraded uh, three-core aluminium <laughs> radiator? It isn't the case. It, it's, it's not, definitely not. I think the biggest problem with that Asanka is the aesthetic appearance. Mm. You know, so car manufacturers like the engine base to look, you know, all black and plasticky. And you stick a three-core aluminium radiator in there, it's going to look like a sore thumb. So, uh, I think that's one of the fundamental problems with putting a three-core aluminium radiator straight out of the showroom. But Definitely, it's, it's, uh, it's an upgrade that's available for any car, anywhere in the world. Being fast is just only one aspect of the game. But we see a ton of money being spent on stopping power and brakes, right? Yeah, I mean, the, that's, that's a given, you know, with a racing car, brake upgrades are, uh, are as important as it is to any automobile. Uh, and there have been a serious uh, a development of brakes over the years. Uh, in fact, I saw a GTR uh, back over there with its wheel off and it had some nice chunky uh, brakes on it. So let's go take a look. What do you say, Asanka? Let's do it. All right. All right, Asanka. There's a nice looking GTR here. Okay. The wheel is off. Yeah. The brakes are naked. Let's take a look. Uh, so, a couple of things that you'll see that's different here is this huge caliper. Correct. You can see three little circles here. Yeah. So basically, that refers to the pistons. So the pistons kind of press the caliper in yeah. on the rotor and tighten the brake to slow it down. So normal, regular cars have like one piston or maximum two pistons. But this car has three on one side, which means it's what we call a six-pot caliper. So yeah. it is like huge stopping force. Obviously, this is a car which has a huge horsepower engine. Yeah. So uh, that's one of the upgrades that was developed on the racetrack, right. where our cars needed better brakes. Yeah. And now it's filtered down to uh, road-going versions. Another interesting feature here is you can see some lines on the, yeah. on the brake. So that's basically what they call uh, slotted discs. It's just for dissipation of heat, you know, because so the brake disc gets really hot. Right. And uh, this helps uh, cool it down a little bit uh, uh, and makes the uh, braking power more continuous and uh, gives the same feel for a longer period more of uniform, time. More uniform, I suppose. Yeah, it's a more uniform. Uh, Braking approach. How is this different to uh, ventilated brakes where you see the uh, the slots drilled? Yeah, in? so 
that's a good question. In, in the ventilated brakes, uh, you had uh, slots, you know, holes inside. Yeah. But what they've done here is they've got like a two-piece rotor. Yeah. So it's actually open in the middle. Right. So you don't really need to drill the slots because that takes away some of application force. When you, when you have a hole there, it, it takes away some right. of the friction. Yeah. So they've maximized the friction, also maximized the cooling by having this two-piece uh, rotor system on the disc. Right. Excellent. Thank you, Shrak, for taking the time from your busy schedule to talk today. You're most welcome, Asanka. I'm always up for talking some car smack any time of the day. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks for joining Garage Talk. And a big shout out to Asanka for joining with me to talk some car smack. Please don't forget to like, subscribe and share. See you next time on the Excite Masterclass for more petrol head related content. <laughs>